Okay, so um, Jason Sonnenberg uh, uh, is a, a man of the Midwest. Uh, he did his undergraduate work at Eastern Michigan in Ypsilanti, which is very close to Ann Arbor from what I see geographically, but somehow he slipped from Michigan defense and went to the Ohio State University uh, for his PhD, <laughs> where he studied uh, computational chemistry on actinides. So this is a man who eats F orbitals for breakfast. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, he then postdoc at Wayne State with Bernie Schlegel. If you've used Gaussian, you'll see the Bernie optimization. Thing. Um, and uh, he, uh, I met him uh, when he became active in Molyneux, uh, when he became a professor at Stevenson, which I guess is in the greater Baltimore area. Is that, I guess, a good place? That's correct. He then worked for Gaussian for about five years, and then he's been with Wolfram uh, as a developer for about the past five years. But he has remained an active member of Molyneux and he is a great, great resource and contributor to our efforts. So, Jason. Well, thank you, Carl and Stephen. It's a pleasure to be uh, with you tonight. Sorry, I'm not there in person, but we just had a wicked snowstorm come through. So uh, uh, two days of solid ice would not have facilitated me getting over to your neck of the woods. Um, for those of you that would like to follow along, uh, either at home or there, there it should hopefully the QR code shows up. You can scan that and get a web version of the notebook that I'll be uh, working through today. And uh, if you if, if you want it at a later point and don't have it, uh, just send me in pretty pretty easy to remember. As Carl said, I have been uh, in the academic environment for quite a while, uh, starting with actinides and then uh, doing a lot of undergraduate uh, research in actinides at Stevenson University and then finding myself over in industry where basically I'm in charge of creating a lot of the tools that I wish I had when I was an educator uh, in academia. So today I'd like to talk about ChatGPT. Hopefully everyone has heard about it. Uh, if not, we'll, we'll give you a, a quick overview. And then we'll talk about how that technology and existing technologies with Wolfram can be combined together and talk about the pedagogical impacts of that from the, uh, the classroom, also from the research lab. Uh, these tools are, are useful not only in an education environment, but also in a, in a research environment. And at any time, uh, feel free to launch into a question, please don't feel that this has to be super formal. Uh, we, we sort of follow the molecule format of, of having more of a discourse than, than a, a full-on lecture. So there is a microphone in the room and I can't hear you. Um, so that being said, let, let's move forward. As my slide isn't moving. Come on, no, there we go. Zoom was in the way. So. Underpinning ChatGPT and other um, large language models are, are these uh, things called large language models. So what are they? Basically, you're training a neural network underneath to predict the probability of the next word, which in LLM terminology is a token, and you're using a ginormous amount of text fragments from a variety of sources. Uh, if you've been paying attention to certain areas of the news lately, there's quite a bit of um, court cases about how one acute, uh, acquires the data uh, that you might use for your text fragments. But uh, basically, the internet was scraped, the whole thing, uh, along with a lot of free um, textbooks and other such things. And all that data was chopped up, parsed up, uh, and fed into a large neural net. And then the LLM, when you give it a prompt, that's the user input, uh, it will recursively determine the next word probabilistically. And I highlighted that in bold because that's the key bit. It's probabilistic. So if you ever did any quantum calculations, um, you know, with H psi equals E psi, there's a probabilistic interpretation of it all. Well, he, here's probability running into you in day-to-day -day life. Uh, until you've worked with a LLM or a, a GPT that's built on top of an LLM, you probably didn't run into the pro uh, probability uh, in your day-to-day -day computing life, but this this brings it right to the forefront, for better or for worse. But it is very different from what we call deterministic computing, which you've done on your calculator, your laptops, your phones uh, for quite a while. I, I won't go into more details about it. It's a really amazing technology. Uh, if you're interested in it, there's a lovely article that dives into all the gory details with it worked out examples. Uh, 
called What is ChatGPT Doing and Why Does It Work? So if you if you want to start digging, I'd say start there, and then there are references inside to, to get you further along. ChatGPT, uh, here I went and asked it, uh, and it said, here I am. I'm a highly knowledgeable in a wide range of topics. Uh, this is a key aspect. It has a date. So because there is new information always being generated, that has to be fed into the underlying LLM uh, for the bot to be able to have knowledge of it. And so currently, ChatGPT has the knowledge up to April of last year. Uh, anything that happened since April of 23, it literally has no knowledge of unless there's some other mechanism for feeding the information into it. It understands human-like text, so we would say that this is not a natural language um, processor. You can you can put human uh, written text into it, and it'll it'll do something with it. Uh, of course, it it is not uh, capable of feelings or consciousness, um, and it is designed to prioritize privacy and ethical guidelines uh, so that it's not doing something horribly weird. Um, if you would like to follow along uh, for interactivity in this talk, you can feel free, if you have a laptop, pop over to chatopenai.com. The app is available for uh, most mobile devices, and so you can um, pull that up if you happen to have it on your device and would like to, to follow along. Now, I wouldn't be a good academic if I didn't uh, reference the literature. So I am not the first one to be, uh, and first or only chemist to be thinking about ChatGPT and how it could be used in the classroom or in research. Uh, so there are a few articles that I'd like to share with you that I think really help get the, the point across. So the, the future of education and research laid out kind of the scope of what people want uh, in general. And anything here in the green box is a direct quote from the article here referenced in JKM Ed. Uh, everybody wants to overcome language barriers. So if you're working with a student who is ESL, um, you, the hope is that the technology can do the translation uh, uh, between the languages. Um, you'd like to have personalized learning so that we, rather than having a large set of homework problems, but maybe it's a customizable set of homework problems that notices where the student struggles and either gives feedback and or changes the homework problems to help them strengthen the areas that they need to work in. And of course, this is all built on, you know, the idea of having real time feedback where you don't necessarily have an expert like a, a TA or a um, educator in the room with the student when they're doing the learning. There are concerns and they're, and they're not small ones. Assess, assessment challenges, you know, what do you do now that someone can feed in homework problems carte blanche out of a, a textbook or uh, assignment and get an answer back? Um, accessibility, uh, these tools um, are not easily accessible to everybody because they are paid products. Uh, so that does cause some issues about making sure that um, everyone's getting a fair shake at, at, at learning. And then as I was getting to before, the, the notion of deterministic versus probabilistic tools. And we'll see more of this as, as we get going. Um, again, deterministic being when you put into your calculator two plus two, you will always get four back. If you ask uh, an LLM what two plus two is, they may expound on it and try and convince you that it's six. That's just what they do. And that's the probabilistic nature of, of, of their uh, existence or I should say they're coding. Uh, the shortcomings of ChatGPT were laid out in, I think this is just a lovely graphic, never trust in Adam, an AI. They make everything up and that's true. They do make stuff up. Uh, it's known as hallucinating. And it is one of the things that gets to be uh, very problematic. The other issue besides making stuff up is that when you're probabilistically determining the next word that follows a math expression, um, you're not really doing math. You just have a probabilistic uh, chance of getting the right answer back based on if that particular expression happened to be in that very large volume of text chunks that were read in by the uh, training data. So that causes real problems, particularly in math-based sciences like chemistry, physics, and, and, and things built upon those. The other thing is that ChatGPT, just like human beings, needs a chemistry tutor too. Um, the, in this particular study, 
they did final exam results and they were, so they were feeding final exam questions in a variety of different ways to the bot. And what they saw was that it scored 37% 37 or lower on 27 questions. The format of the question, whether it was free response or multiple choice, uh, didn't matter. And what was particularly uh, frustrating is that even if it, even if the bot got the answer correct, it may not be able to explain why it got it correct. So you can see where that would immediately cause problems if you're trying to use this technology as a, a tutor. Well, I would like to say that, you know, I didn't do too much tutoring until I became a professor, but I would like to argue that uh, ChatGPT and other students could benefit from the chemistry tools uh, at Wolfram and from Wolfram Alpha in particular. So we think very strongly that we are the, the chemistry tutor for Chat. GPT. For those of you that might not be aware of our technologies, I, I want to give just a few slides overview of, of what we have to offer in for chemical education and chemical research. Um, I won't go into all of this, but we have quite a few products. Uh, of course, the programming language, it's a high level programming language that's smart when it comes to chemistry and has chemical functionality built right into it. Wolfram Alpha is a publicly available website for computing, doing scientific uh, and other uh, computing through natural language. So you, you tell it your request, like I want the population of France at a particular year and it'll spit it back or do math upon it. Um, we also have uh, uh, notebooks to, to do all this inside of. Uh, here, these are designed uh, to be able to do multi-step Wolfram Alpha calculations, basically. Uh, I won't show you this today, but it's pretty cool stuff. Uh, we have ways of expanding the language and the function repository and packlets of functions. So uh, we can, we ourselves and others have been adding um, programs, uh, functions to the, to the language. And then there are also uh, demonstrations, which are manipulatives on particular topics. There's quite a few of them for chemistry, actually, somewhere around, uh, I want to say it's like six, six or 900. Uh, but we have quite a few that you can use in your classroom. But these are all the tools that we're trying to make accessible in some form or another to the bot. So we'll start with Wolfram Alpha. As I said, it's a publicly available website. And I can switch over and it looks like this. So you can put your, uh, let's see, we can put in queries. What is the population of Pittsburgh? Uh, divided by the molar mass of water. Because everybody was just dying to know what this was. Uh, but this is the sort of thing that Wolfram Alpha is able to do. It, it knows how to parse that into a, a computation of finding the city population of Pittsburgh. It knows how to get out the molar mass of water. And then it does the division and keeps track of units, which in this case would be person times moles divided by gram. Now, why this isn't surely what you needed to see after dinner tonight, it is just an example of the sort of uh, fun STEM uh, stuff that you can do with Wolfram Alpha. In the chemistry area, we have quite a bit of coverage over the usual uh, general chemistry topics. We're always adding new ones and growing the content. Uh, myself and students that have worked with me over the last few years have been, have been doing this. If you have students at the high school or undergraduate or graduate levels that would be interested in participating in this. We have uh, programs and internships for that. So uh, let me know or, or reach out. Um, we can get you more information about that. But as you can see, you can put in queries such as balancing equations, uh, determining you know, the form of the equilibrium constant. We don't plug in values yet, that's in the pipeline setting up the rate of reaction, expressions, and, and doing chemical conversions, all are supported. And if you happen to purchase the pro version of Wolfram Alpha, you can get access to the content behind this step-by-step -step button, uh, which is one of the things I'm responsible for. And this is um, automated solution guides to solving the problem. So as a, as a professor, I wish I had the ability to have a computer generate all of the answer keys for homework problems. This is now what I, I do day to day, uh, building exactly that technology. But that's available um, 
uh, with a proscription and many college campuses now have this if they have a site license for any of our products. So uh, you might want to check with your IT department to see if, if your college campus or your institution has those resources as well. Uh, if you're one that uses calculators on the website to do day-to-day -day, uh, calculations, I would advocate that you use ours. They're better, more robust, and understand units better. Uh, but it's a growing collection that we have. And here on the right, you can see our uh, calculator for doing dilutions. It's one of our most popular ones. Uh, besides doing the math and explaining it, we also uh, show the concentration space plot, the you know, possible range of dilutions that one could make. But this is just a sampling of, of the large content that's available from Wolfram Alpha. The language is also rather robust. Since 2019, we've been actively growing our, our chemical functionality. So the, the tools that we're building are very new and they're built by chemists, not, not computer scientists masquerading as chemists, but honest to gosh, PhD holding chemists. We have well over 50 system functions, and we have another 50 uh, submitted functions by us and others, and then over 200 uh, uh, functions in the Packlet repositories for a grand total of nearly 300 different high-level functions to do day-to-day -day chemical stuff. Well, wh what's that stuff look like? We can, let's see, I should just be able to, we can work with chemical formula objects, we can solve uh, empirical formula, uh, problems in the classic way where either you have percentages or possibly a molar mass and we can figure that stuff out. Um, we, we have a lot of tools for chemical structure drawing. Oh goodness, sorry about that. Let's switch back. Uh, we have a drawing tool. So much like ChemDraw, you can go in and um, draw a molecule. Here we'll put a fluorine on the end of that. And we can hit return and that'll send it back over to the molecule. And here's the molecule that we object that we built. I plotted it in 2D and then was able to plot it in the 3D representations that we usually do. And of course these are rotatable as one would expect in an active computing environment. So we have quite a bit for structure. We could do much more than molecules. We can do biomolecules. Uh, biosequences, proteins, the whole nine yards. We're working on crystal structures. The We can do chemical conversions with this notion of a chemical instance. Here's an example of feeding a very long IUPAC name into our molecule object and it eats it and understands it. Also, we can deal with significant figures in the way that a physical chemist would be very happy about. So here we're passing in a quantity of grams, something that might've been measured on a milligram ba balance, and we're passing in the uncertainty on that measurement from the balance. So this is 5.25 grams with 0 0.0001, um, plus or minus 0 0.001 grams from the uncertainty. And so we can evaluate that and get a representation. It's carrying around and displaying the uncertainty. So you don't need to worry about uh, sig fig rules, which no one really likes from what I understand. Um, and then you can do conversions. So here I asked to take this amount of this molecule and convert it to millimoles. And you'll notice it does it and keeps it connected with the molecule, uh, hence the chemical instance, but the error is propagated right through in, in the full fashion that you would learn about in PCHEM lab. So here you can, uh, with these tools, get away from having to teach students how to do partial derivatives and just focus on the outcome and how it affects the design of experiment. We also have some really neat tools for doing chemical reactions. And let me scroll back up. Uh, we can balance reactions that are really complicated. Here, this is one from the chemical education literature that moves around 1300 electrons in some god awful redox reaction, and it just balances it straight off. We can also have representations for functional groups, like here is a uh, alkene. Um, and, oh, here's the, the functional group for an alkene, just a carbon-carbon double bond. Here's an actual alkene. And then we can define something called a pattern reaction where we're gonna brominate, or in this case, potentially um, halogenate across the double bond. So we define a double bond and an HX going to form a single bond molecule where the HX has been added across the double bond, and we pass in information of which atom is which between the reactants and products. 
when we evaluate that, we get this uh, object where you can see where the atoms came from in the synthetic reaction. And then we can apply this pattern reaction to a, a set of molecules. So since we wanted to start with a double bond, a molecule containing of a double bond and a halohydrin, oh, excuse me, halohydrin, ha golly, HX. <laughs> Here we're using, I'm using HBR. Um, so we can feed that in to this reaction and ask for all the products. And sure enough, we get the two uh, species that result. We can do it with something more exciting here, a molecule containing two double bonds, and we get all four products back. Uh, and these are computed on the fly. This is not stored and pulled out of some database. This is actually computed on the fly. So those are all the sort of chemistry tools and educational um, uh tutoring things that are available from our tool set that now we can combine into the uh, wolf into the GPT. How do we do that? We've built our own uh, GPT uh, called the Wolfram GPT. Uh, and I'd like to take a moment just to show you what does that mean? Well, what it is is that we've set up uh, APIs for the chat GPT to be able to talk to our technology. And then we have just natural language uh, uh, instructions to the chat GPT of how to use it and what to do with it and what it can do. And I will drag you through all of this, but I thought I'd point out a bit at the end because this, this is just one giant example of prompt engineering, which is the term given now to the instructions that one would give to an LLM or a bot. And I, I, I think it's kind of funny that we actually have to, uh, explicitly say, um, here, if the unvalued Wolfram language symbols appearing in the results of your code fails to work after several tries, the problem is most likely your coding, not us. Uh, ask yourself if a different Wolfram language function might be more effective, uh, and then it tells it how to give more information. So you notice it's, it's very conversational, uh, and you're very much telling the computer what it should do uh, in much the same that you might uh, tell a new student or um, a small child, actually. All right, so let, let's get let's get to it. So just to remind everyone, um, if you, if you don't remember what phenol looks like, this is what we're shooting for. Um, there are multiple options in this technology. So there's ChatGPT 3.5, that's the free version. This is what your students can get access to for free. Um, if you buy the plus version, then you can get access to 3.5 with uh, the Wolfram plugin, the new ChatGPT 4, which is the latest version, or the Wolfram uh, GPT, which is built on top of ChatGPT 4, which is basically us feeding information back to, to ChatGPT 4. Unfortunately, I, I wish I could say that it's going to stay like this. Uh, things will evolve over time. At some point, 4 will become the free one, and 4.5 will become the next one. Uh, and it's just going to cycle like that. Um, it's an ever-evolving technology, which unfortunately, coupled with the probabilistic nature of it, means that things change a lot, which does uh, provide some problematic situations if you're going to use this in your classroom. All right, so let's let's take a look at what this does. So here's what an interaction with the free version does. Yeah, I, I'm going to use the same prompt for all of this, and I'm going to ask, what's the structure of phenol? So it dutifully comes back with some description, and then it tries to draw a picture, which very clearly, hopefully everyone can see that, is not phenol. Um, it's methanol, uh, actually. And, and so then it goes on, assuming that it drew the right thing, and just keeps narrating it uh, correctly, that it has a benzene ring and an OH group, but it doesn't at all match the picture that it was given. And that's the best that it can do. The free version of ChatGPT uh, can't, can't render chemical structures. Now, if we add our technology there and let ChatGPT make calls out to us, it can indeed do a better job because it goes out uh, and asks us, hey, what, what's the structure of phenol? And we deliver back a picture that it then passes on to the user and Sometimes it'll narrate and give extra details, sometimes not, as it did here in this particular case. When you move over to ChatGPT4, it too 
uh, gives a, a text-based answer. It's, it's more descriptive, but again, no picture because it just doesn't have that tech ability. But then when you give it ChatGPT4, our access to our technology, it once again can say, hey, I, I reached out to Wolfram Alpha, got a picture back and, and, and can go forward. Now this might not be very exciting as an example, but it does highlight the, the some of the shortcomings of the different uh, types of tech that are available to you and your students uh, in your day-to-day -day lives. All right, I'm gonna move out of the notebook here in just a moment and do some live examples, but let's just talk a little bit about prompt engineering. And prompt engineering is quite literally the thing that you give to the bot. It can be a simple sentence, it can be a long complicated uh, phrasing, uh, but it's what you provide the chat GPT to, as instructions to go do whatever you need it to do. And there's some things that uh, we've learned. Um, it may be helpful to include sentences, go look up the syntax for a chemistry function before you plan to use it. Don't necessarily tell me what you read, but um, go read it just like you, very much like a human being would go read the documentation before using some functionality. Uh, you might wanna tell it how to solve particular problems. I like when it does chemical equilibrium problems to build those equilibrium tables. Uh, and when it's having a good day, they look just like what you would see in a chemistry textbook. It's, it's rather remarkable. I always am very specific to make sure that it does chemical conversions. Um, using Wolfram Alpha first rather than language. It, unfortunately, our tools are, are still very new. And so because of that, there's not a lot of comment about them on the internet before April 23. So unfortunately, uh, the LLM underlying ChatGPT and others, other LLMs just don't have knowledge of it because it's so new and cutting edge, which itself is a little bit of a problem, but we're working on that on our end to help pass that information on to the LOMs better. Uh, so we did a simple structure diagram um, and I wanted to show you another example that's a little bit more complicated um, and exciting. Hopefully it will load the, the picture, but it may not. So here I asked it, I was asking about allicine. I said, display the, th the face filling, ball stick and tubes, wireframe, the four different ways that we as chemists visualize molecules. And um, it went and talked and displayed something, but unfortunately that picture isn't rendering for some reason. So let's go over to the bot and run a live demo. Now we have no idea how this is gonna come back. I, I hope it does what it did earlier yesterday, but it may not. And you see each time it's one of these purple boxes, it's interacting with our tech, uh, trying to get more information than what it would, more reliable information than it may have in its own uh, neural network. Hopefully it should have an output. Shortly. Let's see. I was getting information about Allison and molecule plot. Yeah, see, it's tried to write code and it seems, hopefully, I figured it out. Well, it wrote code, but it didn't figure out the syntax, much like a human being might. So it, it made four plots of the same thing. Uh, this is incorrect. Yeah, all plots are the same. Please fix your results. <laughs> um, while we're waiting for it to try and do a better job, some of the things that come into play, if you want to be, if you use capital letters, uh, that carries more weight um, in, in your description. Um, so you can say always do something or never do something with capitals and it'll pay, it usually pays more attention to that. Ah, here it got it. So it went in and fixed its syntax and here's the code. Unfortunately, it's all in one line, but
but it wrote code calling the the molecule plot 3D function and getting the syntax right for the plot themes, and then you know put those out into a row. And here we go. Now these are these are not rotatable because this is a flat picture that was sent back to ChatGPT. But in the notebook, they would uh, back over here if we had used our tech, then then they would be completely rotatable. So you can see how combining once the bot figured out just like a human how to you know uh, use the language to get what you were asking. Um, it's actually really quite uh, impressive compared to what it was doing on its own. So that's chemical structure. Uh, molecule properties are, are a bit more interesting. Here is a question from, um, from the Chemistry Olympiad back in 22, and we can feed that over to, to the program and let's see what it does. So in the, in what's happening under the hood is when it reads your text and then it pauses before it decides what to do, um, it has to actually make a decision if it's going to try and answer something or if it's going to call out to us to get something. And here it chose to just ask for the boiling points of all four of those molecules um, to, to make a decision. But this is why... Uh, computer science people don't usually do live demos because the thing is now hung. Let's see. I didn't spell that right. <laughs> so, say again? Hang on a second. I think you lost projection. <laughs> keep, keep talking. Okay. So what, what happened uh, on your black screen that you can't see anything? Or did right. it come back? Oh, good. So what happened is it, it made a call out, and uh, the results of what we sent back to the bot aren't shown. But it got the um, – what, what it got from us uh, was this, that the boiling point – uh, of each of the molecules are these, and then it made a decision on how to, it was trying to, to tell us what all the different values were, but it seemed to uh, have a hiccup and not, not displayed on the screen. But it used that information to figure out that the right answer is BHCl. Um, let's see, keep track of time. Um, let's pick a chemical conversion. I like this one, but then again, I'm a physical chemist, so being able to do uh, air propagation really makes me happy. So did the input. Let's let's take this and, for comparison, go back to just the ChatGPT version. Uh, the version four and ask it. In most cases, any of the chat GPTs will explain what it's doing as it's going along. And you might ask, well, what if I don't want all of that? Well, you can ask it to not show anything and just give you the answer, but the, the probability of it getting the right answer goes down dramatically when you don't allow it to explain what it's doing as it's going along. Because again, the the when it's explaining what it's doing as it's going along, all of those previous words, all those previous tokens that it put out help determine what comes next. Now with ChatGPT4, uh, compared to the free version, it has the ability to call out to Python to let Python do its math, which that means, if you remember back to the slide, uh, back over here, when, yep, there it was, when this JCAMED article said it hope, it's hopeless at math, and it is on its own, but when you can allow it to uh, let a computer language a programming language do the math, then its math is much more reliable. It doesn't it doesn't make up false um, answers to multiplications and divisions and integrals and stuff like that. Uh, but what it does do 
is that um, here, it just picked the molar mass of sucrose out of thin air. Uh, I think that's the right value, um, but it may not be the right number of sig figs. And when it gives its answers back, it may not also pay attention to sig figs. It did here, but that doesn't mean that it always does. So if you're a student or you're, you're working on a publication and need to worry about these things, you're still gonna have to double check it anyways, which might be a reason just to do the math yourself or with our tools. But you can see uh, the difference in how the two different, um, how the bot, if you will, quote unquote, thinks without our tech versus um, using our tech. With using our tech because we're a high level language and a high level chemical resource, it can skip some of this and get closer to the answer right off the bat. Um, let's see, another fun example. So. One of the uh, nice things that can be um, useful if you're in a classroom situation, and I apologize for those that aren't in a classroom situation, um, if you're tasked as a professor to come up with um, multiple different versions of the same program, or excuse me, same problem for say a homework problem set or an exam, particularly if you're distributing it online, the, the bot can be very helpful there. Um, I'm actually going to just pull up the previous time that I ran this rather than running it live because it is a bit long. So here, again, I had asked it, I said, I need your help. And that's key. When If you really want to get some of the best work out of the bot, um, saying that you need, you need its help, uh, positioning it as an expert, uh, you know, I need your help as an expert in chemistry to solve this very important whatever. Um, if you include those, you actually get better results than if you don't. Um, also being more descriptive of what you want it to do, just like if you were working with a new uh, undergraduate student that had never done these sort of things before, you have to lay out the process for them the more you, you talk to the bot, the better off it'll do because that information is then used to predict what comes next. And so again, you, you're basically increasing the probability of a correct answer by giving it more information. So here I said, I've got this, uh, this is the problem. I'd like more copies of it. I only did three here just for the example, but you can imagine that if you needed it to make 50 of them, it would do that just fine. And so it goes and talks through what it's got. It lays out the original problem. It varies the numbers. Now, I was specific about um, uh, keeping the same number of significant digits as the original problem. If you don't do that, you might get a, quite a bit of variety and might get something with only two sig figs, which then if you're grading on sig figs or as a component of the exercise, then you're going to you know, have to go back and redo the problem anyways. But it, it'll, it'll generate multiple copies of that. And if you've got the Wolfram tech enabled, uh, it will go out and double check the, the and compute the, the results, um, which is nice because then you don't have, I mean, even the free version will generate variations of the problem, but if you want it to also do the, do the math correctly and give you the result, then uh, having our tech uh, can be helpful uh, there as well. Lastly, the other one that, that's fun, if you have to write code or you have to teach a course where your students need to get up to speed, I know there's a lot of interest, or at least there was at the 2022 BCCE in doing more big data science inside of chemistry. If you happen to have to do that in your classroom or are excited to do that in your research, um, ye, there's a learning curve and a lot of that's gonna be involved with coding. And so one of the things that is used a lot um, is to have the um, to have the bot actually help write code. And it has varying results. Um, but overall, it, it does much better than you would expect. It might have some syntax errors from time to time. Uh, but it's usually workable code that'll get started, whether it's in Wolfram language or in other languages as well. So here I have told it to read in on this new molecule pattern. That's the thing that we use to represent functional groups and our bonding object. And it read that from the documentation, told me what it got, and then it went on and it wrote the code for 
a list of of uh, functional groups, and it built the the code to do that, and I didn't have to do it. So what was handy is that it read in information about the coding, and then it brought with it, it knew the definition of a hydroxyl group is an OH with a single bond, or a carbonyl is a CO with a double bond. It brought that all with it and implemented it, which that starts to get very, very helpful. And that code in, in when I cut and pasted it over into the notebook and executed it, it did correctly predict or correctly write the molecule patterns for these functional groups. The other thing that's particularly useful is if you happen to have the unfortunate situation where you've inherited code from somebody else and you don't know what it does. Um, so you can give it code. Here I gave it an example of code that I wrote and then ask it to go explain it. Or as a lot of um, new coders are doing, they will rather than having it simply explain the old code, they'll just have it rewrite the code and insert comments, uh, which it can do quite well. So here I just asked for an explanation, but it is spot on noticing exactly what each of the lines of code is doing and then it's explaining what's going on. So you can very easily imagine a situation where if you're doing some coding and teaching students to get up to speed, you could have some examples that um, you have in your documentation or your training materials that you can don't have to necessarily explain, uh, you know, have comments in the code because you know they can feed it into the bot and, and get that back if they want. So those were just some small collection of examples that you can do with the technology. Um, not surprisingly, it can do reaction balancing and other day-to-day -day tasks that you might have to do, um, determining elemental composition. Um, it, it, it does quite well at all of that. Um, but you may find that depending on your situation, whether you're you know, using it as assistant in your own research or you're uh, doing something that um, in a classroom where you need, we have young scientists that, that might need some help, uh, it may or may not be helpful to use a tool. It may actually be more work. It might be um, more efficient to use some um, traditional teaching methodologies than this. All right, a little bit of summary. So just to circle back, the prompt is what you feed the LLM, or in this case, the chat GPT, uh, to, that's what you're telling it to do. And so prompting by far is the most crucial thing that you can change or improve to get good results. Uh, and there's a lot of literature out there right now, not only for the chemical community, but just prompting in general of how to do it. Um, some of the take homes that I will provide you with after working with this for over a year, uh, not only myself, but my colleagues back at Wolfram, ask it for chain of thought, which is just a formal way of saying, ask it to explain what it's doing as it's going along. Let it give you more details than you probably actually need uh, because it helps improve the output. Um, if you're doing something unusual, give it an example. I need you to help me with this. Here's an example, and I want you to change it in this way or do something that way. Uh, that helps significantly. Stroke its ego. Tell it that it's an expert, and you'll get better results. It's weird, but it also read all of the internet, so take that as, as you will. Um, the other thing is emphasize the importance of what you're asking it to help you with. Um, that will improve its 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 results. Saying that you're doing copyrighted work or you're doing publishable work uh, because those uh, phrases would be connected to high quality text that was fed into it, it tends to seem to trigger better results from it, which is a bit crazy, but that is what it is. Um, and again, don't, <laughs> don't take shortcuts. Try and be more verbose with the darn thing. Uh, be as comprehensive, again, almost as though you were working with a, a small uh, small child or a very young scientist. Uh, it'll, it'll be worth your time to get stuff back uh, if you're gonna use the tool. Uh, just some take homes about ChatGPT. Um, when you bring ChatGPT to Wolfram, uh, you get a pretty powerful tool. Um, 
And so long as ChatGPT decides to use our tech <laughs> and not do it on its own, um, but you can you can do some really powerful stuff and possibly get to a situation where, um, at least in the classroom, you can do things that you weren't able to do before because you can offload some of the um, day to day tasks to the the chatbot and the technology that the chatbot can use. So if you're okay with the chatbot doing some of the math or the error propagation, um, you can then focus on the design of experiment, for example. Uh, ChatGPT4 does better than 3.5 because it can do the math inside of Python, so it's more reliable rather than just making it up as it goes. And then uh, our Wolfram GPT improves upon ChatGPT4 because we can generate chemical plots, we, can, we have error propagation built in, and the data that it's pulling from is user is expert curated uh, chemical data rather than just whatever the um, internet happened to think about. So, so we have we are a reliable source of chemical information for for planning for your classroom. Wolfram Alpha, our website, and ChatGPT three point five are both free. So um, those are the resources that you could have for free uh, if you wanted to use. Uh, GPT-4 or the Wolfram GPT, your students would have to have a subscription, which may be prohibitive for um, your, your classroom cases. Uh, the last thing I'll leave you with is that when you combine the bot with technology like Wolfram, uh, non-trivial uh, post-undergraduate STEM problems can be tackled by the bot uh, in a rather remarkable way. Uh, some of the examples here that I showed you were relatively um, simple. Um, it can do a lot more and it can do it in more than just the chemistry domain. It can solve physics and math problems um, with encoding problems with remarkable prowess uh, that, that is, is sometimes just shocking to be perfectly blunt. Um, so uh, there are useful links. Um, we have quite a bit of chemistry stuff. Uh, we have a uh, uh, we have a new online dilution calculator that I didn't show, has a lot of background information. So if you're working with biology students who always forget how to do dilutions, uh, this would be a nice web page for them to, to utilize along. And it has instructional materials connected with it to explain what's going on. If you decide to use our tech, we have a fast introduction for chemistry students book that sits right between you know a classic chemistry textbook and documentation so that you and your students can get up to speed so that you don't have to um, reinvent the wheel. Um, and then we do have a curated list of all the chemical resources. There's quite a bit of material, examples, all that sort of stuff uh, that's available here. And I'll have a, like I said, we'll pass along links to, to this stuff so that you can get to it um, outside of the meeting. And at this point, I would love to thank you for your attention and thank you again for inviting me to speak to you today. It was a great pleasure and honor. And I'd happily answer any questions you might have. And we can uh, take some time and run some more um, queries with the uh, ChatGPT if you'd like. So thank you.